I've lived this stuff for 40 years. This is the culmination of 40 years of learning for me. This has been my whole career. This is, this is where it's got to, and hopefully I can keep growing and learning and moving it forward. But as a scientist, as an educator, it would be uncool of me not to share this with as many people as we could so that this knowledge is out there and people could make good, rational decisions about where they want to go. So this is our why, what, what the Seeker Foundation is about, the philosophy behind what we're trying to achieve. Um, we've put this animal up here deliberately to start it off with. That is a five to seven year investment. They don't just happen. Well, they can occasionally happen as a fluke, but if you want to consistently produce quality animals, you have to actually work at it and you have to make it happen. This photo was on Putanui in about 2014, six years after we started a quality deer management program on Putanui, and there, there were dozens of stags like this on Putanui uh, as a result of that program. This is an investment in um, the quality of the habitat, uh, five or six years, seven years of age for an animal that good. Uh, that, that is an investment in restraint, not shooting him as a spiker or a first head. It's an investment in his mother as a hind to grow plenty of milk so he gets the best possible start in life. So an animal like this is a five to seven year investment in a really good outcome and you have to work at that to make it happen. And where we can link conservation and hunting comes from this animal needing to be in good habitat and that's what this presentation is all about. It's about getting it right for conservation and hunting because that's the only way that we'll have sustainable hunting on conservation land in a public, political, economic uh, and biological sense. So I'll crack on. A little bit of background about what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a bit of background about Seeker and I'll talk about what a hunting resource is some basic game biology and how that feeds into the principles of game management and how different approaches take you to different places and the approach we as a foundation are trying to, to promote and then I'll sum it all up at the end. So all the way through there's cool photos here, you'll notice many of them are off Potanui. Uh, one of the cool things about studying radio collared stags on Potanui for five years is I got to go there three times a month for five years um, and you get some cool photos when you're on a place like Potanui. Our seeker herd came from six animals released uh, in, on Putanui in January 1905. Gifts from the Duke of Bedford in uh, Woburn Abbey in England. They're a highly efficient forest forager. They pick up stuff off the forest floor, mushrooms, acorns uh, in their home countries, uh, leaves, little grasses, herbs. They're very, very well adapted to our Central North Island uh, forests. They've expanded their range over almost 10,000 kilometres now. Today is about 25,000 of them out there, sustaining a harvest of between seven and 8,000 animals a year. And their range covers a whole lot of public and private land, indigenous forest, exotic forest, shrub edge, farmland, and, and semi-farmed landscapes. We've got really good bloodlines in New Zealand. There were five different subspecies of seeker on Moburn Abbey when we got our stock. The tour Tourist and Publicity Department got those six animals, three hinds and three stags. They had uh, five different, the ones we recognise are the Nipponese and the Manchurian. Um, our bloodlines are really good, but it's not about the blood, it's about the quality of food they have. Only feeding will bring out the breeding, so it's critical that these animals have access to good quality nutrition if they're going to produce good trophies. They're highly sought after. Uh, there's about 20,000 seeker hunters in New Zealand. A third of New Zealand's estimated 65,000 deer hunters target seeker annually. So that's a fair bit of uh, hunting pressure. $18 million to the Central North Island economy. That's what hunters put into this economy through not only just heli seeker but diesel at the service stations, groceries at pack and save. Uh, till, till receipts through uh, hunting and fishing and the likes. Um, our desire as an organisation is to eventually get herd of special uh, interest status under the GAC legislation, but to do that we have to seek co conservation and hunting outcomes. It's not just about us and hunting, it's also about where these animals live on public land. But the Kaweka Mountain Beach project, which operated from the mid-1990s through to the late 2010s, 2017, 18, provides quite a good model for how we can do that and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. First of all I want to talk about the hunting resource and basically the hunting resource is the habitat 
the animals and the, the apex predators at the top, the hunters. And in sixth form biology, you learn about trophic pyramids or food pyramids. You need 100 plants to feed 10 consumers to feed one predator. That's kind of the, the math of it all. But at the end of the day, this is the foundation upon which the whole system sits. You've got nutrients and water and sunlight coming into the feed plants that feed your animals. If you haven't got this rock solid, then you've got nothing. So we've got to think about that all the time as hunters, that the habitat is the foundation upon which our hunting resource is built. Habitat like that is really common in the Mohaka Manuka country. This is a place we call Sherwood Forest and they head to Matai Creek. And that grows nothing. It doesn't grow good anything. It's dead forest. It's got no future. It's just been hollowed out. Um, if you want to grow fellows like this, it, they won't grow there because only feeding will bring out the breeding. My partner's German and her father was a handyman and he used to get really frustrated when he came to New Zealand and looked in my shed and tried to build stuff. And he'd say, you can't build a nuclear submarine out of a box of rusty nails. And, but that's the reality. You cannot build that nuclear submarine out of that box of rusty nails. So only feeding will bring out the breeding. Um, the whole premise of my radio tracking study was that we hunted down here for 10 years and, and collected heaps and heaps of data and the scrub stags were awful, but every now and then something like this would turn up down there just for the raw. And you knew damn well that they'd come from somewhere else, uh, whether that be Pakatudu or Lock and Bar or, or Purunui or somewhere. So hence we put radio collars on them and found out that that's exactly where they come from. So, but the reality is you cannot grow stags like that if they haven't got the nutrition. In terms of game biology though, the key issue is females, the family groups associated with females. Because we all know that deer separate for most of the year, except for the rut for 10 weeks, stags are in the feeding country, family groups are in the breeding country. And this is a great ahimanoa photo of Gary Harwoods of a family group of seeker deer, a couple of adult hinds, um, three young ones. That's the nucleus of a, of a sort of fairly typical seeker family group. They are the engine room of the herd. How they perform uh, is what um, dictates your herd outcomes. And that's the same for all our game animals, whether it's wapiti on the tops of Fiordland or, or tar in the bluffs of the Southern Alps. Breeding females form matriarchal family groups and they occupy quite discreet home ranges. Proportionally, Therefore, most of their environmental impact of these often larger groups occurs at the same place. Um, and, and so if you look at game animals, it's the females and the family groups associated with females that inflict most of the habitat impact. Males are quite different, and, and we all know this. You've seen mobs of velvet stags out in the tussock during the summertime or out in Lake Topo Forest pines feeding on the grass. Um, they're targeting the highest quality of nutrition to get as fat as they can to grow the best antlers and to be successful during the rut. And, and that nomadic seasonal movement means that they have far less environmental impact over time because they're spread over a much, much bigger landscape, between three and ten times larger home ranges for males than females. Um, the tar is even more so, 200 hectares for a nanny group. Uh, and a bull tail will go 50 kilometres down the Southern Alps over his summer wanderings and then back again. You know, so the home ranges occupied by males and females are completely different. So these matriarchal family groups, um, the, the dominant female often has a male fawn, her offspring, um, her daughters, her sisters and, and their offspring, they all live together in these family groups in the breeding country. But between about 10 and 24 months old, this young fella, he, he moves off to be with the boys. That's his motivation, is to leave mum and do his OE and go and find some, um, some boys to play with. Because he has to compete in this scenario, mixing with the big boys, testing himself, gaining his confidence, gaining his strength, so that come the rut, they can move back onto the breeding range and he'll have some success. And it's this diagram that sets up the, the home range differences and the habitat use of the two sexes. Females and their family groups, real little home ranges, males and their home ranges, fattening country for much of the year, back to the breeding country for 10 weeks for the rut. That's 
that's the biology of all our game animals. And our radio collaring works helped us determine how big um, those home ranges is. This is the Omaru airstrip, Omaru hut. Uh, Mavis Davison did a whole heap of work there in the 60s and 70s. And by putting coloured collars on hinds and stags, she could work out their home range. The average home range of a seeker hind living on the Omaru flats is just 1.7 kilometres long. So you draw a, a circle, 1.7 kilometres in um, circumference, or whatever that is, full um, diameter, um, that's the sort of home range that a female that lives at Omaru hut occupies. And she'll come and feed on that lush grass by the Wharipaku outside the back of the hut um, at night, and she'll braise that broadleaf beside the, the toilet. But that's where she'll spend her whole life. Stags, on the other hand, uh, the average home range of a seeker stag is 5.9 kilometres. So they're moving out to the Puranui grass seasonally to get fat before they come back to mine. So this is what's been documented in, in the literature around um, this, these landscape movements. The maximum distance for females was 6 kilometres and the maximum distance for males was 17.7. .7. That's a bloody long way. You draw a 17.7 kilometre circle around Puranui, which is the, some of the best feed you'll get in, in the region, uh, and that covers a fair lump of the Ahimanawa, Kawaka and Kaimanawa area. Both Dan Harris and myself did radio collaring work and our information from the radio tracking work just completely hand in glove fits Mavis's work that her colours did with their coloured collars. So they just set snares in the manuka, and as the deer walked through their game trails in the manuka, those snares would bust off and they'd, then there'd be a set of coloured tags on each animal. And those coloured tags were recovered later by hunters shooting them, and they measured how far away from where that snare was set with blue and orange or whatever it was, number 23, uh, and they worked out how far these animals were moving. One hind had five necklaces on, <laughs> and unfortunately there's quite a few hung up and died from strangulation, but that was, this is well before um, animal ethics committees became involved in this sort of research. So, yeah, um, it wasn't all perfect, but taught us a lot, and, and radio collaring it is the more modern version. So it sort of tells us the type of information, where do family groups live, how big are their home ranges, what sort of habitat are they occupying, uh, where do stags live. We, we know that Females live in heavy cover, often warm, sheltered, heavy cover, forest and scrub. That's the critical aspects of, of their habitat needs. Stags, they're targeting more open country, herbs and grasses, and it makes them more vulnerable. Those velvet stags out on the open tops through summer, uh, late spring and summer, incredibly vulnerable. And we know that they go 15 kilometres uh, away in March to breed and then back to the feeding country again in June. So these are all really important understandings of animals at place about how they use these habitats that we're needing for maintaining our hunting resource. I want to talk a little bit now about different approaches to game animal management. There's no right or wrong way to game animal management. It's just your management will take you to a place. You need to know where you're going. Um, I'll explain this graph. If you release game animals into suitable habitat and then let them do what they want to do, They'll slowly increase at first, then they'll grow exponentially, but then they'll start hitting the ceiling called carrying capacity. You can only fit so many um, sheep in the paddock. There's only so many groceries in the store, and slowly um, they, the herd stops growing to a point where it can't grow anymore. The only fawns that can be born are if one dies and creates a wee bit of space for that animal. So um, you can drive your deer herd up and down this curve by either protecting females, you'll drive your, your herd closer to carrying capacity, or shooting females, and you'll drive your herd away from carrying capacity. Farmers try and hit the sweet spot. That's called maximum sustainable yield harvesting. So if you can hold your population at that position, you'll be able to just keep taking off an annual crop of game every year, um, yada, yada, yada. But what we do know is that carrying capacity is not the same. You get a big drought, or well, you better get big cold winter, the carrying capacity of the habitat changes from season to season. So we've got to be a little bit careful that we don't um, sail too close to the wind here all the time. I want to talk about 
five different approaches to game animal management, and they're all valid approaches. Um, there's no right or wrong here, they just take you to five different places. This is called maximum population objective. This is called maximum sustainable yield objective. This is called quality deer management objective. This is called trophy management objective. And this is called Eugenie. Eugenie. Yeah, eradication. So maximum population, protect your females, heavy harvest your males. Don't shoot the hinds, why don't you shoot the stags? Just shoot the stags. El Dorado, more's better. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Huh? How many of you hunted fallow deer in the Waitotra or the Whanganui in the last few years? Hmm? A few there, eh? A lot of does, eh? How many bucks did you see? <laughs> 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 Maximum harvest, heavy harvest on the males, but you limit your female numbers to try and keep in the sweet spot. This is called farming. This is what farmers try to get. This is what they aim to do. This is called quality deer management. You protect your young males till they get to about three years of age and you harvest your females pretty hard each year and you balance out your, your population. Um, this is that you really protect your males till they're fully mature and you hit your females real hard so you maximize the quality of the habitat so they can grow good antlers. Uh, and then there's Eugenie. But that, you've got to harvest all animals faster than they can breed or reproduce and you've got to have no reinvasion from external sources, otherwise you're, you're never going to do it. And of course, you've got to have deep pockets. The cost of harvesting to extinction um, looks something like this, and this comes off getting possums off cuppity, actually, to be fair. So game animal density up there, the cost of removing each animal there, and as you pull the population down, the cost of removing animals gets more and more. Uh, it's relatively cheap to halve your population. If you halve your population again, costs you four times as much. And if you halve your population again, costs you 10 times as much. If you want to eradicate possums off Kapiti Island, $2.70 to take the first one off, $8,200 to take the last one off. You've got to have deep pockets. You've got to have resolve. Okay, this has got very limited um, application, so I won't talk about that anymore. This is quite a complex graph, so I'll explain it. Okay, we've got the age of the animals from 0 to 10 out here for females and for 0 to 10 out here for males and each of these blue bars represents the proportion of the herd that's in each of those year classes and as you follow the, the cohorts through the year classes um, the survival is different between different age and sex classes of animals so your herd structure, um, you end up with a bit of a herd structure like this. For seeker um, if you were just to harvest the males and leave the females, you'd end up with seeker 20 plus seeker per square kilometre. You'd have a few fawns each year, but half of them would die because they wouldn't have enough milk from mum and they'd struggle. Uh, and then if the females, if you were able to survive to be a, a yearling, uh, the chances of being killed are really low because no one shoots hinds. Don't shoot the hinds, bro, just shoot the stags. So you, you get the scenario where there's no trophies because they're not old enough and they can't find enough kai. Um, the habitat impact imposed by all those family groups is huge and so your habitat's munted um, and you end up with the sort of deer herd that we've got in the Kaimanawa um, remote experience zone at the moment. These are photos taken from the game camera survey in there that Josh and Ron and others were part of from December to February last year. Um, these deer are really small, bonsai deer as Matt calls them. Um, they're old, the average age is really old, uh, nearly 7, Alan, 6.5 6 or something, average age of 6.5, which is incredibly old for a deer herd. Uh, Clements Road, it's more like under 3 years old, average age. Um, and not many fawns. We had a, we had a Kiwi in, on this game camera, and it was about there one night, image of a few, and it was bigger than this fawn. This fawn's probably 2 kilos and its chances of survival are really low. So you found a few dead fawns when you are in there in June, eh? These little fellas just can't cope. Mum hasn't got enough milk because she hasn't got enough kai, and they just die. So this is, this is the sort of deer herd that um, you get when you have this idea that more is better and that you don't shoot the hinds and you just shoot the stags. You end up with very few trophies because uh, all of these get killed. 
and you got all these girls just munting your habitat and eating all your food to the point where there's no groceries left in the store and they're all eating cardboard. So I'm not an advocate for maximum population uh, manage, game management approach. This is what happens on most New Zealand deer herds. Um, it, by default, it ends up about maximum harvest. Your trophy age classes are still pretty limited. Um, ooh. Uh, but you're harvesting a lot more females, so you've got a slightly more balanced. Um, for seeker, this happens at about 12 to 15, possibly less than some of the real bony acid high country soils, but um, quality management, that's what a deer herd under quality management looks like, real balanced, um, almost one for one males and females. A lot more animals in your trophy age classes because you're deliberately trying to protect these young, ignorant, um, spikers who when they leave mum they've just got no life skills and they stand and look um, and you're still clipping back these girls a little bit to keep the habitat pumping and you've only got six or eight there per square kilometre and you will get mountain beach to regenerate under this sort of scenario at this sort of deer density and that's where you get quality stags as well this is the more the approach we're trying to achieve in Fiordland with the Wapiti herd real low uh, in fact, for Wapiti, it's two deer per square kilometre, so it's, it's real low. For Seeker, though, you could get it in the five to six, really smashing the hinds, pushing the, the stags out. But in my view, you probably don't need to do this for Seeker. It's, it's working very well for Wapiti, but, but they don't mature till eight, nine, ten years old. So a, a good Seeker stag will mature at five years old. So um, the cool thing about this approach, though, you get those dominant breeders suppress the contribution that these um, young breeders have to overall gene flow in the herd. So these girls get um, covered by the biggest, strongest bulls and that's how nature intended it. So you've got a, um, our philosophy is that there's, we've all seen places like this in the commonals and if you haven't, then you haven't done much seeker hunting because this is pretty common in, in um, many parts of the seeker range. No one wants that outcome, it's not sustainable. Um, that photo, that previous photo occurs up here. What, we're, what we think, it, well, me as a professional and the Seeker Foundation has embraced this with our um, herd of special interest application is that we think quality management has a really strong role to play in, in Seeker management going forward. Deer less than half the current capacity of the habitat but with a balanced population. That's what it would look like. Six to eight seeker deer per square kilometre. So that's sort of five or six is Clements Road. Uh, sneaking up eight, um, you know, it's kind of Cascade Hut, Omaru River um, sort of area. So we're not talking about no deer. You've got to be good to hunt them. Um, less habitat impact because the females are uh, not such a big part of the herd and more stags pushing into the trophy age classes. The thing about this is that there's lots of competition. When these girls are, uh, are cycling in the rut, they've got lots of boys vying for their attention. So the, the rut really rocks. Um, not like the other ones where there's just so few males that any puzzle gets to pass on genes, good, bad or ugly, and you get what we call genetic drift from any male being able to successfully breed. To me, that represents what I think the Seeker Foundation should be aiming for. We know we'll get mountain beach regeneration at these sort of densities. That's a herd that's healthy, that you'd be happy to put that venison in your freezer and that will give you amazing rut hunting. Um, but most New Zealand herds look like this, particularly Waro exposed herds, because these guys here make up the lion's share of the annual commercial harvest that goes to Europe, uh, combination of velvet and, and carcasses. These girls are all the way in maternity at that time of year and they're not even available for harvest. So that's why these guys just get so smashed and there's nothing left for the recreational hunter come April. Poor survival, few trophies, highly productive herds that are doubling every two years. So you've got to work real hard just to stay on top of the, the numbers. Sometimes if you look at these um, herd structures, you can just see how a different approach gives you a completely different herd structure. There's not much of a roar on this. 
not many of these girls are cycling, and when they do cycle, they haven't got a lot of, there's not a lot of competition between boys uh, for the ones that are. So um, the raw just doesn't happen for a herd that looks like that. Um, and as you change the herd structure over time, uh, you get a more and more intense rut. And this was the classic lose-lose for conservation and hunting. Um, when Doc were flying around in a taxpayer-funded helicopter shooting eight-point velvet Jap stags off the Kawaka main range in the late 1990s, early 2000s. It's just, he's not eating Mountain Beach. Um, fortunately, we managed to get them to see sense, and in July 2008, they stopped shooting stags. They just started at hind-only harvesting, which was a much better outcome. But the waro industry does the same thing. Um, that big barrel-chested red stag would have been way better for someone to take his son or daughter hunting in the raw and shoot a big red stag rather than that guy making a marginal five hundred uh, to keep his business running through a waro concession process. Um, what we want the waro industry to do is complement recreational hunting, not compete directly with it, and that's direct competition. Um, that stag would have got shot in the raw by a recreational hunter and while he's shooting big velvet stags like that, there's no hinds available for harvest because they're all hidden away in maternity. So there's a lot of learning to do for doc and for hunters around some of this. In terms of the future, we need a, a longer term approach. Um, we need to protect the foundation of the herd, which is not the deer themselves, it's actually the habitat that they eat and the habitat that they depend on. For hunters, only resilient habitats will produce sustainable hunting outcomes. And male-dominated harvests work completely against everybody's outcome because we end up with hardly any raw and sick forests and skinny deer. We've got to think about that as hunters. We've got to move to a more um, caretaker role rather than just be consumers all the time. Just take, 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 take. I'm entitled. I've got rights. Just take. I've been hunting all my life. My dad hunted and his dad hunted before him. It's my right to go and shoot whatever I like, whenever I like. Yeah, maybe, but sustainability of the high country for the future is really important and we've got to think about how we do that. Us as a foundation, we're voluntary non-profit, we're committed hunters, businesses and researchers, we're backed up, um, have been for the last five years by the Seeker Show. The, um, last year, lots of exhibitors, lots of ticket sales, one of the biggest weekends in Taupo of the year, um, supported by Iwi, Ngāti Tūwhare Tour. Don't underestimate the value of that, that is really critical political support. And we're seeking to work with conservation interests to deliver benefits for both conservation and hunting because we know that good habitat supports our hunting, will make our hunting sustainable. We've developed these cool messages. Main one, shoot more hinds. Shoot more hinds. Help him grow, shoot the doe. So, you know, a lot of hunters would see this thing in late October and go, oh, don't shoot the hinds, bro. Shoot, look, she's got a fawn. We'll have more deer. Shoot him. You know, they're doing it pretty tough. He's done all right, but he's pretty skinny. She's pretty skinny, but she's got another one in the oven. The best thing to do for the habitat would be to take her out and leave him alone. A lot of hunters would take the spike out, believing that's the best thing to do. Depends on what outcome you're after. To help people understand this, we've put together the winter hindsight competition. Um, and that's why we're trying to get hunters to focus more on the hinds. How old? What condition? Is it pregnant? Has it got milk and a fetus? Does that mean it's breeding every year? Or has it got no milk and no fetus? Or has it got milk and no fetus or no milk? You know, that helps you understand whether she's bred every year or she's breeding every other year or some of these girls only breed a couple of times in their whole life. Um, so this is to help hunters move from consumers to biologists and managers. Think a bit more about uh, what you're seeing on your block because the hinds tell you what's going on in your forest and you can win some cool prizes. Summary, male and female game animals are not equal in terms of their resource value nor their environmental impact. Hunters generally value males and um, female groups inflict most of the environmental impact in terms of what the herd does to the habitat. Then these differences set up the win-win for conservation and hunting. We want stags, Eugenie wants to get rid of females, let's work together to work out how we do that. So win-win, and the Mountain Beach project actually exploited that value really well once they stopped shooting big velvet stags on the main range. But we've got to set very clear objectives. Eradication is not achievable, so it's not a valid objective. As low as possible is not a valid objective. 
Mountain beach forest regeneration after natural canopy collapse, that's a valid objective. So we've got to think smart about what we do. And that requires education of not just hunters, but conservationists, because most of them live in urban settings. They're completely disconnected from the mountains. They don't even know what a beach forest is or how it operates. But less deer or no deer sounds good when the minister stands up and says it. So we've got to, we've got to educate both sides of the spectrum. Um, hunters need to move from just being end-use consumers of deer to actually Klaitiaki guardians, managers of the mountain forest resource that supports them. Um, and we've got to monitor our progress, which is why this information is so important. How old? Is she pregnant? Has she got milk? Has she got a fetus? You know? Seek Foundation is committed to working with DOC to achieve these better outcomes, and it's easier with some officers than others. So, yeah, that's all I've got to say about that. Yeah, thanks for listening. From a hunter, we'll see it because every hind starts breeding as a seeker hind should start breeding as a two year old if she's well fed and mum's had plenty of milk and she should breed every year. And so we'll see it lots of young deer breeding and there's not only is there milk in the udder in June and July, but there's a fetus in the womb as well. So that's indicative that she's bred, uh, breeding every year. And the, and the roar will go off. There'll be single calling all over the place because every cycling hind will have two or three stags red hot interested in her. There'll be a dominant stag there keeping them all away. But all of us know what seeker hunting's like when you get into that scenario. It's just outstanding, eh? But it doesn't happen when your hinds are skinny. And so for straight away as hunters, we'll be able to detect that from how fat our hinds are, how often there's, you squeeze the udder and get milk and see a fetus from last year's mating, uh, and that they're young when they're breeding, and hopefully we'll see the average age of our hind harvest come right down. We don't want them to get 14, 15 years old. They should be clipped off at eight or nine all the time. I noticed a big difference between um, <clears throat> the, the forest and Clements Road has got a lot of, carries a lot of food, so when I go to the fly-ins, it looks like someone's been through with a weed whacker and knocked everything down. You can look down and you can see a long way. And that's purely animal density. Because there's that 19 kilometre access road, and then everybody's little sneak track to all their little spot X clearing, and the deer are under enormous pressure. And so the average age of females at Clements Road is 3.3, and the average age of males is 2.6. Compare that to the average age of hinds in the Rangitiki, 6.6. That's a massive difference in average age. You know, so that's exactly right, Steve. You know, uh, and hunters need to just start queuing in on those tohu, eh? Just look at the signs. Well, um, I pretty much pass on what the, we're all about to hunters I see down Clements Road because I'm down here all the time. And, and a lot of them, um, some of them have never heard of the, they've still got that old philosophy of shoot all the stags and yeah. leave the hinds, you know, and, and as, you, as you point out, it doesn't work. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I try to pass on that information and quite, the guys are quite receptive to it. And so I think as members of the foundation, particularly as committee members, we have an absolute obligation to share this and put it out there and socialise it as hard as we can amongst the 20,000 people that come and share this resource with us. Because, man, if we don't get it right, someone else is going to step in and take it away from us, eh?